Good morning, church. Um, my name is Diane Phelps, if we have not met yet. I am the chair of our Social Action and Mission Outreach Committee. And um, since we have such a full service today, I am going to just have you read your bulletin for all of the morning announcements that we have. I have a special announcement and introduction to make today. I have with me Patty Clifford, and she is, has been a volunteer for World Vision for 10 years, and she's going to talk a little bit about something exciting in our Cascade neighborhood here that we're doing alongside six other churches. We're going to be doing a walk for water on May 18th. So I'm going to hand you over to, to Patty, and we also have a short video. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me here, and I really appreciate your partnership with all these other Cascade churches. Like Diane said, we decided to come together as a community to host this event because we think it would be phenomenal to paint the uh, Cascade bike path orange for one day. This event happens globally. So around the globe, thousands of people are gonna gather to walk 6K. Why do we do a 6K and not a 5K? Because it's the average distance that children walk to collect dirty water. So unfortunately, one in five of those children will die because of that dirty water that they are forced to collect and drink. Um, so your registration fee is the best part. Not only does it mean you get to join with all of us in Cascade and you get to walk, roll, or stroll, however you want to do that with your family, down the back path with all of us, um, but every dollar goes straight to the field immediately and starts changing the life for somebody. Um, and, and we say water is fullness of life because with that water, they get the chance to go back to school. They get the chance to better their communities. They get hygiene stations, hospitals get access to water. It's a real trickle-down effect. Um, we are going to start the event at Cascade Fellowship Church. We're going to go right down the bike path on Cascade Road, and we're going to have a fun finish line party at Thorn Apple Covenant. If you want to participate, but 6K sounds like a lot, you can go down and back as far as you want to. Nobody's keeping track. This is not timed in any way, shape, or form. It is fun, and more importantly, it's life-changing. So if you'd like to join us, that would be phenomenal. There's a $15 off discount right now if you use the code clean water um, that has been provided by a larger donor who would love to see more people participate. Um, I'll be out in the back if anybody has any specific questions afterwards. The best part is if that date doesn't work for you, let me know. There's a workaround. Let's check out that video. Hey, my name is Karen, and I live in the Grand Rapids area here along with you, and I've been moving my feet with World Vision for the past about six years ago. And first off, I just want to say thank you for signing up for the Global 6K to bring clean water to communities around the world. Uh, about five years ago, our family had the opportunity to make a water walk with the women and children in a village in Zambia. And we met this young lady, Maria, in the upper left-hand corner. And I just want to tell you her story a little bit. She lived along with her grandma, who you see pictured below her. And all her life, all she had ever known was twice a day making a long walk to collect dirty water. And Early that morning, we sat underneath the shade of a tree and she just said, she explained how difficult it was for her to do her studies and how she was failing at a lot of her schoolwork. Many days she wouldn't even make it to school because she was too tired or too sick from diseases that she had picked up from drinking dirty water. And she said, because of this water, I promise, she said, I will do better at my academics. Well, that afternoon we had a chance to make the walk for water, the very last one with Maria and her grandma. And it led us to this uh, hand dug six foot deep water hole that you can see. It's filled with water that uh, is literally dirtier than the water that I see when I get done washing my car. Yet this was their only source of water. And each day Maria had been making this trip twice a day to collect water. 
Um, I had learned earlier that year that in communities like this, over half the kids don't even live to see their fifth birthday. And when we took that water back, that became reality as I walked hand in hand with Maria. But because of the work of World Vision, all that is being changed because this is the well that we came back to at the end of that hot, long walk for water. And we put that dirty water away. And for the very first time, that community, because of the work of World Vision and because of all the work that they had done in meeting their goals, they pumped water up out of the ground for the very first time. And I wish I could be, just bring you right back there, church. If you could hear the water coming up and the woo, 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 as that pump went up and down. And the tribal chief leader you can see was the very first one to get a glass of clean water. And he raised his arms and he just said again and again, Tulumbu, Tulumbu, which means thank you. And I need you to hear those words today. Thank you for the work that you're doing. The first child to get clean water in that village you can see in the background is Maria. And you guys, she had dressed in her very best that day. She had on a lacy yellow dress. And when that water came out of the ground and she drank cold, clean, clear water for the very first time. First, she got so excited, she dropped the glass, but then she picked it up again and her eyes got so bright and it was like electricity coursing through her veins. And I said to her, Maria, Maria, how is it? And she kept saying three words again and again. She said, it is good, it is good. And church, I believe that what you're doing by putting one foot in front of the other and on loving the poor and oppressed brings a smile to the face of your father in heaven. And he looks down on you and he says, just like he did when he created the world, he says, it is good. What you're doing is good. You were made to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you for what you're doing in the Global 6K. Know that I'm cheering you on and I can't wait to be out there with you putting one foot in front of the other. Let's go. Amen. Let's stand together as we come to worship and let us pray. God, we come to you today in the midst of the mess in the, of our world and of our lives and we come each carrying our own sorrows and joys, hopes and fears, but we come to join together to sing your praise, to call to our minds the great things you have done and are continuing to do in our midst. And to remember that in an ever-changing world, your love, your goodness never change. And that is why we sing with joy. That is why we worship, whether we're on the mountaintop or in the deepest valley. So God, fix our eyes on you, our solid rock, our good shepherd, our salvation. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has the praise. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has the praise. He has the praise. Oh, you love Him. You
Good morning, church. This is uh, the last time I'll be in this pulpit, and it is um, an interesting day for me, for you too. We know that change is in the air, but I would remind you that God is too good to be unkind. God is too wise to make any mistakes. And while we can't always see God's hand, I don't know where I'll be in a few weeks. I think I'll be with my Episcopalian friends. Thank you for coming today. God has plans, and we know that God's plans are good. And when we can't understand God's heart, excuse me, when we can't understand God's hand, we can trust God's heart. Please, friends, trust the heart of God and the plans that God has for each one of you. We know that God is good because I'd like to... um, let you know one of the things we're going to do today is dedicate Eliza Bennett Boone, who possibly is the cutest child God ever made. But there are more. We are so delighted for Adam and Elise Homan in the birth of L. Raven Homan. Some of you have seen her, possibly, again, the cutest child God ever made. And we also celebrate the birth of Isabella May. Tiedemann, proud parents Kayla and Jason Tiedemann, possibly the cutest child God ever made. And we thank God that little Annabelle Howe is doing much better. She's breathing on her own. I met with Pat Howe. Some of you would remember Pat. Um, Again, one of the cutest children God ever made. Remember how I'd always let you think your kid was my favorite? They still are. So friends, um, we also grieve with Tim and Jennifer Murtaugh in the death of Jennifer's father. And we grieve with the larger Christian church in the death of Reverend Janet Long, a former regional minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Are there other prayer health concerns that I might have missed? Well then friends, let's go together before our Lord. Lord, we do see that you do great things and your justice is boundless. Your love is everlasting and your goodness to us, Lord, is far beyond anything we deserve. So today we thank you for life, for new life, for Eliza and Elle and Isabella and Annabelle, and we ask your blessing on these beloved baby girls. Lord, we too come before you with our failures, with our flaws. Because we know we have not been the Easter people that we can be. And we ask for your forgiveness and we ask for strength for the things that we must face. And Lord, for those who are burdened, let them know, Lord, that you carry the load with them. For those who are feeling lonely, let them see they have a family in the family of God. For those who feel like they're in free fall right now, help them to see you alone are our solid ground. For all who are discouraged, let them turn to you, to look to you, to see that your mercies, Lord, are fresh every day. You are ever-present, you're always loving, and you always care. And God, for those who are in war-torn areas or people who feel unsafe or who've lost loved ones to illness or violence, for those who don't have the basics, including water, Help us, Lord, to put hands and feet to our prayers and do as you would have us do, to be generous if you have been generous to us. We ask for healing for all who are ill and lift before you Leo Rapp, Annabelle Howe, 
Debbie Jones' sister Stephanie, Michael, Brian, Andrew Alt, all who are dealing with sickness or cancer or treatments. We ask that you comfort those who mourn and lift to you Jennifer and Tim and the family of Reverend Dr. Janet Long. We pray too, Lord, for Pastor Gail, for our church leaders, for our board, for our staff, for this congregation. We ask, Lord, for guidance as we live in hope for the future that you have for each of us. But now, Lord, it's your time. Help us to set aside the cares of the day, the running thoughts of our minds, so we can focus on you, listen to you, and turn to you. Open our eyes, God, and our hearts to imagine your limitless love as we seek to be a church filled with disciples of Christ people who work for wholeness in a fragmented world. Now we unite our voices as one people, your people, praying the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is... My name is uh, Ethan Anderson, and I am uh, serving as your offering elder today. This, uh, you might want to note it, this is probably going to be the shortest, uh, uh, shortest uh, meditation that you get from me, because you're going to be hearing a lot from me here in, in, in a little bit. Um, the verse I was focusing on was Luke 10, 27, and it reads, And he answer, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Today, I'm thinking about how thankful I am for all of you and the passion that you have. The fact that you care so much about this church, that you care so much about our church family, that you care so much about our faith and, and what goes on here. To me, that's wonderful because you can only care for so much. Your stress budget's only so big, right? And the fact that you all allocate to us that care and consideration and that passion, I find absolutely uplifting. And the love that you show for each other, for your neighbors, our desire to be able to be one church, the, the unity and the teamwork that I see on a regular basis, um, I'm incredibly thankful for that. And um, so thank you. Um, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for these people. Thank you for, uh, for being with them. Thank you for being in their hearts, for motivating them, for uh, letting them realize just how many important, uh, important tools they have, their time, their talent, their treasures, and the dedication they have to, to this church and to you and putting those to work. I, I can't think of, a, of another place that I'd want to be on a Sunday morning. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> It is an honor that we now get to have the infant dedication of a much-loved baby girl. Ro I know it, yeah. Roxy and Josh Boone are now here to dedicate little Eliza, uh, along with her family, and little brother Bryce. Josh and Roxy are beloved members of the church. They were married here. They dedicated Bryce here. They usually are up in our tech loft. We thank them for including the church in the raising of their son and now their daughter. And I would ask their family to all come forward now, please. You've heard me talk about these words before, how in the Old Testament... Hannah brought her son Samuel to the 
tabernacle to be dedicated to the Lord. And certainly in the New Testament, shortly after he was born, Jesus was brought by Mary and Joseph to be dedicated at the temple as an infant. Even the Son of God himself was dedicated. And today we have Josh and Roxy here desiring to do the same thing, to dedicate their treasured daughter, Eliza Bennett Boone, to be dedicated before Jesus Christ. This is such a blessing. She is beautiful. She is amazing. She is surrounded by a loving family, by a wonderful big brother, by grandparents, by aunties. We as a church family join in this act because this is a covenant. It's a promise, not unlike the promise that Josh and Roxy made about that same spot when they got married. It's a promise that with all of her loved ones, Eliza is going to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a promise with you too, church family, that you support the programs for the children of this church, that you support young families like Roxy and Josh, and that we all do our part to make sure that every child who enters our doors is given the opportunity to love God, serve Jesus Christ, and be led by the Spirit. You know already, children are special to Jesus Christ. Remember how he said to the disciples, let the little children come to me. Forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And just having Eliza and Bryce here and your children here making the sounds children make, that's some of the best music before God. Eliza certainly reminds us of the innocence and the purity and the wonder of childhood. And Josh and Roxy, your daughters of beauty. We love her with you already. And I hope that this sanctuary will always be a special place for her. And her presence reminds us of everything that is good and right in God's world. So Josh and Roxy, you've done this before. I'm going to ask you some questions, and then I will ask your family and the church some questions. A good response would be either we do or with the help of God we do. Whatever comes out will be just right. So Josh and Roxy, do you receive this precious girl as a gift from God and seek God's grace and the community church's support in nurturing and caring for Eliza? And do you promise to raise Eliza to live living before her lives of Christian faith and humility and grace? And do you promise to remain faithful in love to your child, to, array, to raise Eliza in a loving home, whatever the future may bring? And now to Eliza's family. Do you promise to support Josh and Roxy as parents, grandparents, as aunts and uncles, will you promise to guide, love, and cherish Eliza as your niece, as your granddaughter, as she grows in her relationship with the Lord? And a special one to Eliza's aunties who are here today, also were raised in this church, Charlotte and Veronica. Do you promise to love and support not only Josh and Roxy as your siblings, but do you promise with the amazing gifts God has given both of you to help in the raising of your niece and be there for her in fun and adventures as she grows with God? That's right. We know you two. You'll be good at this. And last but not least, Big Brother Bryce. Will you be a good big brother to Eliza and play with her and love her? Yes? Best sermon, best sermon right there. Church family, would you please stand? I ask you, as you stand before our Lord and God, will you provide for this precious girl the opportunities to learn about Jesus Christ, to help her grow in her love and commitment to the Lord, that she might find Jesus Christ to be her personal Savior? If so, with the help of God, we will. With the help of God, we will. Would you pray with me, please? God, you've shown us through your son that whoever receives a little child in his name 
receives Christ himself. And this morning, we are so grateful that we get to be here with Eliza. As she grows physically, may she also grow spiritually. And may her life reflect the love and the grace and peace that only comes as a gift from your Holy Spirit. May she come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and desire to serve him and walk with him all of her days. Lord, we treasure Josh and Roxy and ask you to give them the gentle wisdom and parental patience necessary to nurture a child in the Christian faith. Lord, it's not easy today. Strengthen and help them. And thank you for their loving families. Thank you for this church family as they bless Eliza and her family. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And behind you, Roxy, maybe Audrey, would you help me with this, please? Are some roses. Roxy and Josh, one of them is for you. As you raise your daughter and you see her go from bud to full flower. Audrey, I'd like you to keep one because there's a special role as a grandmother. Veronica and Charlotte, I'd like each of you to take one because an auntie can have such a role in the life of a child. And Roxy and Josh, in my heart, I'm sending one Josh to your family, to your parents as they raise her. And if there's one left, let's leave it on the communion table as a reminder that um, God's got this baby girl. Adam has some gifts. There's a blanket made by our Soul Warmers group and a Bible so that little Eliza can know the Word of God and a certificate too. And if I may, I'd like to walk this sweet girl down the aisle and introduce her to her family. And now I call our children forward. And Mr. Adam's going to help me with this children's moment, but I need our kids down here right away because Adam's got a bag that I want you to see. But as he holds this up, sometimes it can be hard to believe in something if you can't see it. Sometimes it's hard to understand something unless you can actually touch it. In Sunday school today, you're going to hear about one of Jesus' followers, a disciple named Thomas. He wasn't there on Easter. He was away. He didn't get to see Jesus rise from the dead. He didn't get to be there with the women, with the other disciples, and he felt very left out. A week went by. He didn't know what to believe. People are saying, Jesus is alive. He'd seen him die on the cross. What were they talking about? Well, I have a bag here, and Adam, could you ask maybe two people? You don't know what's in there. It could be a puppy. It could be some crickets. Somebody reach in there and see if you can guess what it is just by touching. Don't look. Don't look. And don't pull anything out. 
huh, I got some, like, I don't know, not sure. Okay, Adam, what's in the bag? There's candy. There's stuffed animals. Now you can see. Now you can believe. Some of you got to touch that. Well, today in Sunday school, you're going to hear about how Thomas got to see Jesus and touch Jesus. And Jesus let that happen so Thomas would believe that he would stop doubting and believe. So we have Mr. Dan and Miss Christine who are going to take you up to Sunday school. You can spend your sunshine dollars if you haven't. But before you go, could we do a prayer and would you repeat after me? Let's bow our heads, show God reverence. Repeating after me, dear God, thank you for being with us. Help us to trust you, even in times of doubt. We love you, God. Amen. And let us stand together as we continue to worship God today. never had a day quite like this, an ending sermon. I don't know what I'm supposed to preach about today. I'd like to begin by telling you thank you. As retirement is just around the corner for me, there's so much I want to thank you for. As I look out among you, I have so many memories of camp and 
trips to New York and um, mission ventures and crazy times going to, I don't know why, but the Choo Choo Diner and Fat Boy Grill, we could do it. Um, trying to fly kites out the window of the van. We weren't on main roads. But just doing things together, um, especially the majority of the time I've been here as your children's minister. And then the leap of faith you took to have me be your pastor. It's the greatest honor I've had in my life. You've been so kind to my family. You've been with Mike and I in our darkest hours. It was days of infertility, Mike's cancer, deaths in my family. I treasure you, and I will always hold this church in my heart. But today, I want to do what I've always done when I've stood in this pulpit, and that is tell you about the goodness and the grace of God. The Sunday, we were looking at the continuation of the Easter story, remembering that Jesus appeared to his followers not only on Easter morning, but later that day, again the next week, and more times after that. He appeared to women. He appeared to travelers on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to 10 of the disciples, scaring them so much that they thought he was a ghost. And then at the end of John's resurrection account, we hear about Thomas. And thanks to Thomas, we have some deeper insights into that goodness and grace of Jesus. Thanks to Thomas, I think we can grow in peace, in faith, in hope, and in resilience. Now, when you hear Thomas, I would guess you think doubting Thomas. There's more to him than doubt. Scripture tells us he was called Thomas Didymus, which means twin, indicating he had a twin brother or sister. Thomas was present at the raising of Lazarus, which Pastor Gail preached about last week. Thomas urged the other disciples to go with him, to go with Jesus. Go with him, that we might die with him, Thomas said. He knew the danger of following Jesus, and he was a man who was not afraid to ask questions. When Jesus explained in John 14 that he was going ahead to prepare a place for everyone, Thomas was the one who said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? But we don't remember Thomas so much for those questions. We remember he doubted the resurrection. He doubted the witness of the other disciples. Our scripture today considers doubt, doubting, not believing, being a little skeptical. How about you? Do you have doubts? Do you question what might seem too good to be true? Doubt comes up in life. There are those times where you feel uncertain, you feel unsure. And doubting is not always a bad thing. Having doubts might hold you back from making a poor choice or a wrong decision. Doubts can keep you out of trouble. It might help you redirect your path. Rather than scorn Thomas for doubting, let's look at why he questioned the resurrection. And then see how we might even be in debt to Thomas for what his doubting teaches us. Our scripture today is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It's where Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after that, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? 
Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told them, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Thomas, you've probably seen this famous Caravaggio painting, Jesus allowing Thomas to reach out and his hand and examine the wound in Christ's side. Thomas had made that really detailed, long statement of what it would take for him to believe, and Jesus gave him the opportunity to examine the nail holes and the wound that was in his side from the spear. It's an extraordinary, bold claim that Thomas asks. He really wants proof. He needs to see and touch to believe. And graciously, Jesus allowed this. He allowed this prodding of his body so Thomas would stop doubting and believe. In Savannah Guthrie's book, Mostly What God Does, she points out that in the face of doubt and fear, Jesus says, in effect, come closer. He doesn't recoil from our doubts or our questions. He doesn't take offense To him, our skepticism and questioning are opportunities for deeper connection. Jesus says, come closer. So he says to Thomas, in effect, come closer. But like Thomas, we have doubts. Everybody else had seen Jesus. They saw him eating fish, breaking bread, walking around, being among them, assuring them he wasn't a ghost, but not Thomas. Thomas was left out. You know that feeling of being left out. I would guess that you do. Maybe you didn't get the invitation to an event that everybody else did. Maybe everybody else had a common experience or a shared memory or an inside joke and you're not part of it. Maybe you feel like you're not in the know. You feel unsure. You feel excluded. An exclusion happens. I'm finding that out as I'm aging. I'm a senior citizen now. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> exclusion happens due to age, to gender, to nationality, race, or beliefs. Being excluded can build resentment, the walls of division, and it can be a lonely place. That's why Jesus is so transparent here with Thomas. Everybody else had seen, but not Thomas. We don't know where he was on Easter. I'd like to think maybe he was looking for his twin, saying, there's trouble for Jesus. Maybe they were identical twins, and maybe he had to just lay low. But when he heard about the resurrection, that he'd missed this appearance of Jesus, it was too much. i got to say, too, the disciples had been through a horrifically bad time. There was gossip. Imaginations might have been running wild. The trauma of the death of Jesus certainly had to produce some post-traumatic stress. So Thomas had reason reason to doubt. But thanks to Jesus, that's not the end of Thomas' story. Three times in this passage, Jesus says, peace be with you. And he gave the disciples and he gives us peace. His peace, knowing that when we're hurting or confused or mourning, we need that peace that passes understanding. And not only did Jesus give peace, but he breathed his spirit This is like a prelude to Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes to the disciples on Easter as well as on Pentecost when it came in wind and fire. Jesus is bringing peace. Peace. Knowing that the disciples had sinned against him. Peace. Knowing that there had been doubt. Peace. So they could believe. Thanks to Jesus, you and I get a much-needed assurance of peace and of forgiveness. And thanks to doubting Thomas, I think the doubts we might have get put into words. Thomas wondered, is Jesus really alive? I've had some of your children ask me that as I've been your Sunday school leader these last few months. They think he didn't really die. 
because it's a pretty hard concept. They're smart kids. How could someone who died on a cross and be buried be alive again? It is a bit curious that Thomas questioned this because as Gail informed you last week, Thomas was there when Jesus raised Lazarus. Jesus brought others back to life. Could he do that for himself? So Thomas doubts, and Jesus answers you and me and Thomas with, yes, I am here. I am alive. Put your finger here if you need to. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe, because the opposite of doubt is faith, my friends. And faith is believing even when you can't see I wonder, did Thomas actually touch the wounds? The Bible does not say. But Thomas says, Thomas says it all. He says, my Lord, my God, that is faith, that is belief. That's the end of doubt. Jesus made sacred space for Thomas to see the truth, to regain his broken faith. And he does that for us in our questions in our times of broken or bruised faith, in those moments where we just need a touch of Jesus, he's there, he's here. And I would encourage you to bring him your questions, bring him your doubts, let him come to you and heal what's broken in you. I'd want to note just super quick here that two times in the scripture it's mentioned the doors were locked because of fear. Jesus entered anyway. Locks can't hold him back. Doors can't keep him out. Death itself could not hold him. I'm grateful John gave us that detail twice. Nothing can keep you from the love of Jesus, including yourself. He's got the answer to your fears, to your doubts, to your questions. Our beloved Bob Van Streen would say to you right now, keep the faith. And thanks to this short passage, friends, we have hope. Jesus told Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus is talking about you because you're here today. You haven't seen him with your own eyes, or if you have, I'd sure love to know about it. You're here because you haven't seen, and that is hope. Hope is described as the confident expectation for the future based on the character and the plan of God. Let me say that again. Hope is the confident expectation for the future based on the character of God and on the plan of God. How many times have you heard me say God has a plan and God's plans are always good? It's sure hard to see that some days, but that's the truth that I stand on and that's where I place my hope. You can hold on to hope. Because God has plans for you for this very moment, for this week, for the year ahead, and for your eternity. I've got hope for this church. You have an excellent board, a committed and talented staff that I'm going to miss. You're a congregation. Ethan, you and I were on the same vibe today. You are kind. You are generous. You are faithful people. You've been through a lot. You survived a pandemic. You've gone through the highs and lows of being a congregation because you're a family. And you're beloved by God. I would remind you that we are to be a movement of wholeness in a fragmented world. That you can visualize, I hope, the limitless love of God, what it can do, and then act on it. You're invited to do a water walk. That you know that unity is our polar star. We don't do church alone, but together. So I have hope for the bright future God has. And I'm holding on a confident expectation of what is ahead based on the character of the God I know and how I have seen God's plans unfold. And I know every one of you is going through or has gone through or will go through difficult days, times of doubt, and challenge. That's going to call for resilience. Resilience is the ability to adapt well when difficulties arrive. 
Think of the challenges the disciples faced. They couldn't go back to being fishermen, tax collectors, or zealots. They had to be resilient. So Jesus, at the end of this passage, packs in more signs and wonders that aren't all recorded, but the disciples knew them, so they could go on with resilience because Jesus is going to lead them and ascend to heaven in 40 days. The Romans and Pharisees are still problematic. They had a church to begin. They had to change everything to build the kingdom of God, and they did because Jesus got them ready, and Jesus gave them resilience. There's one other thing we have to give thanks to Thomas for. In seminary, I heard one of my favorite profs say, and I wrote it in my seminary Bible, that this is the final witness, my Lord and my God. As you read up through the time when Jesus ascends, nobody else addresses him that way. Peter's got a lot of apologies to make. No one else says, my Lord, my God. The doubter is the believer. The doubter proclaims in faith. The doubter can encourage all of us. Thanks to Thomas, we have yet again this witness as to who Jesus says he is. And I can think of no better parting words to you, beloved church, than Thomas's, my Lord, my God. And friends, I pray that you find peace, hold on to hope, be resilient, and keep the faith in Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Amen and amen. Thank you. In my failures and in my flaws, I hope you know it is always, always, and forever will be for him. Jesus extends his hand to you, that nail-scarred hand, and invites you to his table. Doubters are welcomed here. Those who need hope are welcomed here. Those who feel left out are welcomed here. Everyone, everywhere is welcomed here because the one we love the most is our gracious host. So I invite you to take the bread, drink the cup, and remember and share the Lord. Let's sing together. No, we don't sing now, do we, Lisa? Let me share these words instead. Ethan, I'm going to give the words of institution, and then if you will pray. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, saying, here's my body. It's broken for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And friends, he is. He is coming again. So all who believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, are invited to this table. Um, dear Lord, we're thankful for so many things, uh, especially today, Jill Ford and her dedication, her tremendous years of service, her guidance, her counsel, her friendship, uh, her leadership, just all of it, just all of it, Lord. And we're thankful for uh, you being with us in the highs, in the lows, in the twists, in the turns. You're always there. We may not always be there for you, we may not always be focusing on you and what you want us to do, but you never give up on us, Lord. And uh, that makes all the difference. In your name we pray. Amen. For those of you who are visiting us today, 
You are welcome to come to the table. Open communion, and you are loved. Friends, every week, you not only are invited to communion, but you're invited to be family. 
become part of the church, and by that I mean the whole church, the universal church. You might want to become part of this church. You might want to profess your faith. You might want to reaffirm your faith. Every week I've preached here, every time I've been here since I was a young girl, the pastor gives an invite. Those who've done it before I came here, they invite you. Those who will come after me invite you to be family. So today, you're invited. We're singing living hope. What else do we hang on to but Jesus Christ? And if you feel that Holy Spirit urge to come forward and join or profess your faith, or if you just want a hug and a prayer, come on down the aisle. Let's stand as we sing.
some notes somewhere. I'm going to just not worry about that now. So I'm going to ask those of you who've come forward. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ? The Son of the living God? And that he's your Savior? And that he's got this and he's got you and he's got everything? Will you come to him in peace? Will you keep the faith? Will you remain people who hope that confident expectation that you can count on God's character and God's plans. And please, will you be people who abide and are resilient? If so, say, we will. We will. Amen and amen. Please go have a seat. Some of you, I'm going to hug you. Just I'll get you soon. <laughs>